Hello, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. I trust that you are honoring your mom and the ladies in your life uh, today. So let me ask you, ladies, really quick. Uh, did you stay up late last night burning the midnight oil, knitting socks for your family? Or maybe you really should have been up before dawn cooking for your family. And so, ladies, question, are your kids even awake right now? And if they are awake, are they actually sitting up are they eating something that you prepared, or are they eating like Captain Crunch? So if you're a virtuous woman, Proverbs 31, you might get the idea that you needed to have done all of the things that I just mentioned, but that's actually not true. So today, we're going to talk about Proverbs 31 women. The Proverbs 31 woman, I call her the woman that women love to hate, and so we're going to talk about that. We're thankful for our mothers. Join us together. I think you'll have a great time of worship. And most importantly, let's set our eyes on exalting Christ. Happy Mother's Day to the one who sacrifices all. Love you, Mom. because she takes care of me all day, every day. She's always there for me, whether it's um, helping me out with the kids or stopping to pick up something for me. I can always count on her, and I love her. I love my mom because she takes care of me, and she loves me. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. That's enough. <laughs>
strength within the sorrow.
Take your Bibles with me and turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31, I want to read verses 10 through 31. And as you're turning there, I want to talk about a woman's influence. And the subject that we're talking about this morning is the Proverbs 31 woman. And, and I call her the woman that women love to hate because so many ladies read Psalm 31 and they say, or Proverbs 31, and they say, I just can't be that woman. She is just beyond me. And many women, you know, they say, oh, great, here goes another Mother's Day sermon on Proverbs 31. Uh, I'm watching this in my PJs, and yet this woman has been up all night and got up early in the morning. She's fixed food, and she's been darning socks, so to speak, and making clothes. What What a lady she is. But now before you reach up and turn off the computer or the TV, um, let me let you know, I think you're going to be surprised with some of the things that you hear today in the morning message and also in the evening message. So don't miss it. I really believe that Proverbs 31 and some, some things that come out in a proper understanding of it are really life-changing. I think that they will set you free from a lot of expectations that you might have if you're a man toward women or if you're a lady toward yourself or other ladies. And so don't miss this morning and this evening. Um, Oftentimes we think of Proverbs 31 woman as being this perfect woman. So why do we get that? Well, let's look at verses 10 through 31. Proverbs 31, 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises up while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, reaches out her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Proverbs 31, woman, an amazing woman. An amazing woman that you stop and think she stays up late at night. She gets up early in the morning. She's a fabulous uh, knitter, verse 21. She does not shop for clothes. She makes clothes. And if you need a warm quilt for your bed, well, pardon the pun, but she's got you covered. She makes bedspreads too. She's a sharp dresser, verse 22. She's a great cook, verse 15. She has a great sense of humor, verse 25. She's a great wise teacher, verse 26. She has no fear, verse 25. Her feelings and emotions just don't seem to rise to the surface. They just don't get uh, the best of her. Verse 20, verse 26, she's nice to everyone. She's kind. By the way, she's good at gardening, and not just any gardening. She actually plants a vineyard, and when she plants this this vineyard, she actually grows, whether it's grapes or olives, she has this thriving business that she's productive and she is productive profitable. So she goes out with the proceeds from this vineyard and she buys more land so she can grow more grapes so she can sell more and gain more of a profit. So she's a business lady. She's making money and she does this all with a smile on her face. In fact, verse 12, she never gets ticked at her husband. Ladies, do you ever get mad at your husband? Well, not the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. She wants to do him good all the days of her life and her husband, well, he is a happy guy. 
When he walks by everyone, they look at him and they say, hey, see, see that guy? He married the virtuous woman. What a lucky guy. And her children, well, according to verse 5 or 15, they are gathered in the morning peacefully around the table, munching the oatmeal that she has made since dawn. These are cherub children. They don't talk back. Verse 28, they rise up, they call her blessed, and everyone is happy in this house because their mama is a virtuous woman. Sounds kind of like the scene happening right now in every home watching this, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure the children are lined up in a row watching this. I'm sure that there are probably no children that are sleeping through this. So why can't every woman act like a Proverbs 31 woman? And you catch a little bit of the sarcasm. It's not sarcasm at what the text says or at God's word. It's a little bit of sarcasm at how we perceive it and misunderstand this text. Could it be that not everyone can be like the Proverbs 31 woman exactly precisely because we are not supposed to do everything she does, but instead be who she is? I think the clue comes, the reason why every woman cannot act like a, this woman right here exactly in every detail is because in verse 29, we find out they're not supposed to. Verse 29 says, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. What does that mean as this husband um, exalts his wife? She excels them all. She is the best of the best. She is perfect. She is the perfect woman. And honestly, there are no perfect women just as there are no perfect men. So if God is teaching women and men to expect that a woman should imitate everything that the Proverbs 31 woman does, well then we have entirely missed the point of the passage and we are setting ladies up for discouragement and men for false expectations. Because the woodenly literal Proverbs 31 woman does not exist. There are women who cannot have children. Does that mean they cannot be a valiant, virtuous woman? There are women who, women who do not have the time or do not learn how to knit or don't know how to do gardening or are lousy business people and they can't buy land and sell it. There are women whose physical health they are confined even to a wheelchair. Can that woman be a, a virtuous woman? Yes, she can. But she can't woodenly, literally do everything Proverbs 31 says. So let's just right at the start here. At the beginning of the day that we're going to spend in Proverbs 31, just wipe away some false expectations. God does not expect us to come to Proverbs 31 and imitate every little detail out of this passage. Now, if I ask, is, is God intending that we do everything that she does? If your answer is yes, let me ask you this question. If we are supposed to literally do, or ladies are supposed to do, every single thing that the Proverbs 31 woman does let me ask you this question what does this passage mention that the proverbs 31 woman doesn't do the passage says nothing of her prayer life the passage says we don't find her staying up late at night or getting up early reading scripture it says nothing about her ever going to worship in the temple it says nothing about having a a relationship of physical intimacy with her husband or sharing the gospel explicitly. Now we think about that. This lady's working all day. The passage is telling good things about her, good things that she does, but this is not a comprehensive listing of what she does or doesn't do. What God is wanting us to do here is not do what she does, but be who she is. I'm talking especially for ladies. To be who she is. And the point of the passage is that as women understand where your influence lies and as men affirm ladies who do this and who are this. So with all of that in mind, before we get into, I'm going to get into um, five or six relationships that, uh, uh, that influence or, or project the influence of the Proverbs 31 woman. But with all of that in mind, let me just start out by giving you some misconceptions about the Proverbs 31 woman. First misconception is that God demands women follow her example perfectly, action 
for action. Many ladies in this world literally, physically are incapable of doing some of the things because of some suffering or some weakness or something that they have no control over. So God is not demanding that people follow her example perfectly action for action. Secondly, here's another misconception is that we need to force the culture of our family to fit the culture of the Proverbs 31 woman. What I mean by that is, is this, um, are we supposed to force the culture to say we make all of our children's clothing? Or that we live in a rural environment where we can buy land and plant things? What if God has you located in a city? What if God has you in a situation where you, you literally cannot knit things? So we're not trying to force the culture. If you try to force your family to have a culture of exactly what you see here in Proverbs 31, you are going to drive people crazy, yourself included. If you try to do everything she does and force everybody to be the way these people are in Proverbs 31, you're going to drive yourself and everyone around you crazy. And ladies, by the way, if you try to do that, you won't have any friends. And I'll tell you why. No woman wants to hang around a perfect woman (laughs) or someone trying to be perfect. Here's another misconception that the Proverbs 31 woman is not relevant for today. She's just this old fashioned museum piece. But here's the thing. The heart And the mind and the motivations of this woman are still alive and well today. In our church, praise God, in my own home, Lord willing, in your home as well, she is relevant for today, very much so. Here's a last misconception, and that is that the goal of Proverbs 31 is to push women into servile subjection to men. I can just hear an ultra-feminist reading Proverbs 31 and saying, oh yeah, this is, this is a passage written by men for men to quash women. Well, let me show you that that is just totally false. Because if you look at verse 1, who really instructs us in this passage? Verse 1 says that a man actually wrote it down. His name was King Lemuel. Some think that's Solomon. I'm, I'm not sure that it is. But whatever the point King Lemuel is writing these things down, but what is he writing? Where did he get his stuff? Verse 1, from his mother. These are not the instructions of a man. These are the instructions of a woman who's been talking to her son, and he's writing down what God has instructed her to teach her son. This is not men putting women under their thumbs. This is God showing that there is a freedom in godly womanhood, that there is an influence and a power in being a godly woman. This is not a man thing. Proverbs 31, we see this lady who has seen a lot in life, Lemuel's mother. In verses 1 through 3, she instructs her her son, and she's saying, Um, even in verse three, she says, do not give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys kings. This is a lady who has seen life. She's wise, she's smart, she's powerful. She's seeing kings come and go and she's saying to her own son who's a king, listen, don't waste your life on this and that. And And she mentions women who are selfish. So these are the instructions of a powerful woman to her son. The woman of Proverbs 31 is smart, she's strong, she's capable, she's got moral background, she fears the Lord and she's free and she's fulfilled and she's respected. People take what she says seriously. That is how God wants us to treat women and that is the influence that women have. The text of Proverbs 31 just help you understand Verses 10 through 31 are a poem, a Hebrew poem, an ancient Hebrew poem. And they're arranged in alphabetical order, the, uh, the words. And one verse begins with uh, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then the next verse begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet, all the way through the Hebrew alphabet. Why is that significant? Because why do we use poetry? Think of that. We use poetry as a literary device to express weighty thoughts, important things. 
When someone feels something strongly, they will write a poem about it sometimes, oftentimes. And when they want to reach the mind and the heart and get you really to think about it, they will write a poem. Well, that's the way it was in ancient times too. The Hebrew poets would talk about beautiful things in poetry or weighty things in poetry or things that you really needed to think about. And so the fact that here in God's word, Proverbs 31, we have a poem written about a lady. That tells you God's heart puts incredible value on ladies. Incredible value more value than our culture. Our culture is seeking to exalt women um, superficially just for their physical beauty or just for their um, physical prowess or manipulative control or something. God exalts women so much differently and in such a deeper, stronger way. So stick with us. Ladies, I want to tell you, you want to, to build the right influence it's right here in Proverbs 31, and that's what we're talking about today. And so I um, want to give you some hope. Ladies, here's a question for you. Do you understand how much influence you really do have? Are you teaching your young daughters how to have womanly influence? Do you understand that you have the influence to build or destroy, to give life or to take life, to serve others or to serve self? A question for men. What kind of woman do you seek? What kind of women do you value? Do you ridicule or look down on the weaknesses that you perceive in, in some of the women in your life? Do you show honor to a valiant woman like the one in Proverbs 31? How do we as men react to women? And how you do that really does help your, the ladies in your life become what God wants them to be or turn away from it. So this is on us too as men. So let me show you some relationships between this morning and this evening's message. And really, this morning, I'm only going to get to the first one, okay? So the first relationship that a woman uh, that promotes her godly influence is her relationship to herself, her relationship to herself. Now, this is not just psychobabble here that I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about her identity, but I'm not using that word identity in a psychoanalysis sort of way. This woman in Proverbs 31, she knows who she is. She knows where her influence lies, even though under the surface, she might struggle at times with doubt, self-doubt. But the valiant woman of Proverbs 31 is so in tune with just doing and being what God wants her to be that she's not really sitting there picking herself apart. She's not saying, I like this about myself, and I don't like this, and I have self-doubt over here, and who am I? She's not questioning that. She just, God told me to do this, I'm doing it, and as she does that, she gains stability and confidence. Listen, that's how you gain stability and confidence with who you are. Whether you're a man or a woman, you just find out what God wants you to do, and you just do it to the best of your ability, and you might start out small, but it grows, and pretty soon you're, you're a very confident person without being proud. This woman knows her identity. This woman knows exactly who she is, and she is enjoying the gifts and the skills that God has given her. She's not spending hours in front of the mirror looking at self. So her identity is, based, is not based on physical charm. This is the first thing I want you to see about her identity. She knows she has a good relationship to herself, but her identity is not based on physical charm. Let that sink in for a second. In 22 verses here in Proverbs 31, detailing what makes a woman influential and what makes a valiant woman who makes a difference, do you know what I don't see? It doesn't give any description of any physical feature that this woman has, except for maybe one reference to, she, to the fact that she makes her arms strong. I don't know if that means she's working out. <laughs> I think it's actually speaking in a, in a symbolical way, symbolic way or a metaphorical way, saying that she is strengthening herself to do what God calls her to do. But we don't know whether she's blonde or brunette. We don't know whether she's tall or short. We don't know what color her eyes were. We don't know if uh, she was slim or if she was heavier. We, do, we don't know. You say, well, she had to be slim to do all this work. Not necessarily. Maybe we need to remember 
And being a valiant woman is not based so much on physical appearance, not on the physicality of a woman's body or the charm of a woman's body. The woman of godly, lasting, powerful influence is, is not someone who is basing her influence on physique or physical appearance. Do you know, here's the amazing thing, and I want to talk to single guys for a second, because you know, often if you ask a young single guy these days, um, hey, what do you want in a wife? I, I just about guarantee most of them are going to say some formulation of this, uh, kind of right up toward the top, I want her to be hot. Or I want her to be good looking. Back when I was um, growing up, the word was fine. I want her to be fine. <laughs> Talking about physicality of the woman. The physical appearance, I should say, of the woman. Here's the thing. You could, as a single man, you could marry the Proverbs 31, without, 31 woman without ever seeing her and know that you have found a woman of rare influence and you could know that she's going to bless you and it's going to be a good thing as long as you don't mess it up because she's not gonna because her heart is in the right spot it's not about physical appearance this does not mean to say that there is no value in physical beauty because god made women to have a certain physical beauty but it's not that physical appearance does not matter to this woman in fact verse 22 Take a look at that because she's a stylish dresser. She wears fine linen. She wears purple gowns. She is not running around in gunny sacks and dull colors. She doesn't see that as godliness. I'm sure that she was modest, and I think that's an important thing for our world today to remember. She was modest. We need to remember that in our churches, don't we? She was modest, but I don't think she was sitting there saying the, the, the mark of godliness is you make your own clothes and they're dull and they're this or that. She wouldn't have bashed that, but she wouldn't have exalted that. What really drove her were these relationships we're talking about. And the first one is her relationship to herself. Um, physical appearance and charm only go so far, and she knows it. Probably for most people in our world, 90% of thought goes into how we look, and 10% of thought goes into what we are or who we are. But verse 30 reverses those percentages. It says, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. Talking about physical beauty. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. What's he saying? Spend 90% of your time on who you are. And if you have extra time and 10%, yeah, make sure that you look okay and presentable. And you can make sure that you look good. But what's on the inside, the character, that's where your influence is. The word for charm here in verse 30, charm is deceitful, is used in Nahum 3.4 in the Hebrew of the seductive charm of a prostitute. The physical beauty that arouses a sensual physical response in a man. That kind of charm has power for sure. And it can be used to get what someone wants, whether it be the woman or the man. It can be used by women as a weapon to manipulate and control and get people to do what you want them to do. And that is an influence. But that kind of charm is a weapon. It's not a gift. The thing about physical beauty is that it's so deceitful. It gets results, but, and people pay big bucks to be beautiful and hang around beautiful people, but physical beauty will fail you. It will fail you. No matter how beautiful you are, it will fail you through any number of reasons. The aging process, a car accident that disfigures you, disease, illness that confines you to to a, to a wheelchair or confines you to your house, can a woman in that situation still be a virtuous woman? Of course. Sum it up, the reason why physical charm and physical beauty will fail you is because the curse of Genesis 3 is appallingly thorough in how it diminishes physical beauty. A lot of times it's over time. You cannot cheat the aging process. Verse 31 says that physical beauty is passing. The word there is fleeting. In the Hebrew, it's, it's used in other places as breath, a vapor. So you go out on a cold morning and uh, you can see your breath. 
and you see that vapor, and how long does it last? Whew, it's gone. That is physical beauty. When you are relying on the influence of physical beauty, your influence will diminish, and it will shock you how quickly it does diminish. <laughs> it disappoints. It fades. You can cheat the aging process, but not really. You can cover it up. You can use as much Botox as you want. You can use all the beauty products you want, and it's appalling how much money we spend in our, our nation on beauty products, but at best, we are just masking what's going on. This is all kind of a lie that's hard to unravel, isn't it? Because it's everywhere. We know there's a legitimate use for physical beauty, and we don't deny that, but it's deceiving because it works for only so long, and it can get so easily misused and distorted and twisted and it requires a lot of effort for us to stay current on what the culture of today is saying is beautiful. But tomorrow, what's beautiful today, tomorrow is, is not beautiful. So let me give you an example. In, the, in ancient Greece, the rules for beauty were extremely important, um, not just for women, but also oddly for men. So let's talk to the guys for a second. So the feeling among the Greeks was that if you had a beautiful body, meaning for the men, a muscular, ripped body, that you, they said just naturally you would have a, a, an intelligent mind. So if you had a beautiful body, they figured you were smart too. And if you were outer or beautiful out in your outer body, then your inner person was beautiful too. They just made that assumption that the gods had blessed you in that way. So if you're buff, they figured you're intelligent too. Now, in ancient Sparta and Athens, a lot of guys, just natural among the citizens, they didn't really have a whole lot to do. They would spend up to eight hours in a gym every day. They weren't out working jobs and supporting families. Many of them had the wealth to just independently wealthy. The ideal for a Greek male was to be ripped in the upper body and to have a small waist and to, um, to oil up your body. And uh, by the way, sculpted leg muscles, and don't forget, slim toes. That's what they thought. They thought slim toes were the end thing. So guys, if you have short, pudgy toes, well, um, just hang up ever being what the Greek ideal says for guys. Glistening hair. <laughs> you know, and did you know that in some places in ancient Greece, at least in a couple of different cities, they actually had ongoing walking beauty shows for men. So um, if you had big leg muscles, better than anybody else, they would literally tie a ribbon around your leg muscle and you could wear it around and people would say, oh, he's the winner of the leg muscle contest. Or big biceps, they would tie a ribbon around your bicep or around your calf muscle. <laughs> and you got to wear that around. Now, ladies, on the other hand, in ancient Greece, and by the way, this is just certain time periods of ancient Greece because remember, what culture sees as being beautiful changes. Ladies, on the other hand, is a little bit of a different story. According to the 7th century B.C. Hesiod, the first woman was simply called kalon kakon, the Greek, word, the Greek words, which means, in essence, a, a beautiful, evil thing. <laughs> That's what women were, a beautiful, evil thing. If you were beautiful, you were trouble, a terrible beauty. And the reason why is because they would use their beauty as a weapon. So beautiful on the one hand, but trouble on the other. Doesn't scripture talk about, in the Proverbs it says, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is nets and snares. Actually, that's Ecclesiastes. The woman whose heart is snares and nets. That's this woman who uses her womanly mystique, her physical beauty, her physical charm, to snare you, to draw you in. And the, the, the woman in Proverbs, who is the seductive woman who uses that physical beauty and charm, is doing it to really bleed off a man's resources and his life and his strength and his, his life. Now, in ancient Greece, it wasn't the blondes that were sought after. It was the redheads. They were in. If you had red hair, you were uh, the quintessential beautiful woman. Bronze Age artwork depicts Greek women 
as having fierce looking eyes because they would make up their eyes to look really fierce and they would have red suns painted um, on their on their facial uh, on their on their faces they would shave their heads and they would leave just a, a small lock of hair in the shape of like a snake and then they would take toxic white lead and, and they would smear it on the lady's arms to make them look white. So forget the tan. Today it's tans that are in, it seems like. But in those days, it was the white skin. Did you know we found, archaeologists have found ancient burial sites for Greek ladies and men, by the way. And what they have found in these Greek burial sites of ancient times, they have found jewelry, rings, earrings, lots of mirrors, handheld personal mirrors. They would take them to the grave. Perfume, tweezers, hairpins, tools to clean the body. It was all about beauty products for the Greeks. Now, not much has changed. We don't get buried with mirrors and earrings and all of that. But we do value physical beauty in an out of, just in a strange way. What has changed, though, is what each culture thinks of, about what is beautiful. So it is futile if you say, I want to stay up on the current culture. I want to be beautiful, physically beautiful all the time. Good luck with that. It's not going to work. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. That is is the turning point of the passage right there. You want to understand the, what it is to be a woman of valor? The virtuous woman, the Proverbs 31, it's that. A woman who fears the Lord. And all of this stuff that she does comes from her understanding of her relationship to herself, that she understands that her influence is not physical beauty, her identity is rooted in strength of character. You see, there's a better way. Her identity is rooted in strength of character. Ladies, that is where your influence lies. Her identity is rooted in strength of character. Now, we could make the list of models, both men and women from the past, movie stars, pop culture figures who just a few years they were in and you never hear of them anymore and there's really not a whole lot of their influence left but why is it that we can look back hundreds of years thousands of years and remember different ladies ladies like ruth ladies like sarah ladies like um, jonathan edwards wife other ladies that we that we look at and we say there was a godly lady and we're still living. You see, ladies, your influence is what you write onto the hearts of the people in your life. Her identity is rooted in strength of character. Who are you, ladies? You are more than your body. You are, your identity is rooted in strength of character. And to, in tonight's message, we're going to look at the fact that her, her identity is rooted in her relationship with the Lord. But for this morning, her identity is rooted in strength of character. You remember what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 says? It talks about the true beauty of a woman. It's on the inside. Unfading beauty of character, a gentle, nurturing heart that's not clamoring for status and is not selfish, but is seeking to, to be precious in the sight of God and the people who need her in their lives. Now, I remember... Many years ago when I was in college, I remember in the mornings I would get up and we would go to breakfast and we would get into the line at the cafeteria and I remember uh, there was this one lady who would serve food. And I remember that she just had an attitude that was horrible. She was angry, she was negative, she was critical. And I remember going through and, and, and I just thought, oh, it, it was just hard to be around her. But someone got hold of her. I don't even know who it was. Another lady, I'm sure, some, maybe some fellow students, came along beside her and they started discipling her throughout that, that semester. And I have to tell you, in the next three to six months, she changed. 
She went from, in my mind, someone who was very unattractive to someone who was very attractive to someone that you would say, this person has a, uh, a love for people and she's serving people. And what changed physically? Absolutely nothing. But it was a beauty of character. It was a beauty of what's on the inside. A woman's most formidable influence is not physical charm, but quality of character. That's the emphasis in Proverbs 31. Don't stop and say, in order to be a Proverbs 31, I need to learn how to knit. Say, instead, to be a Proverbs 31 woman, I need to develop in character. If you develop in character, you'll start doing many other things. Your life will open up in some amazing areas into the specifics of what you do. But all of that comes from who you are. Who you are. Proverbs 31 sets women free to discover all that they can do because of who they are. And they can be all that God intended them to be intellectually and spiritually rather than simply being, as our culture calls it, eye candy. Especially when ladies refuse to keep up with the latest physical features and makeup lines and beauty products and all of that stuff, and they're focusing 90% of the time on who they are. So who really is this virtuous woman in Proverbs 31? And I want to tell you, single guys, I, I want to tell you something. The physical characteristics of a woman, I never encourage anyone to marry someone that they're not attracted to physically. I just don't do it. There has to be a zest, a longing, an attraction. But I want to tell you something. If on the top of your list is a certain set of physical features, I can guarantee you, you're going to be miserable later in life. If that's all she has, you're going to be miserable. Because your heart's in the wrong place and so is hers. I think we all get this wrong at times, myself included. Various applications. The passage is not saying carte blanche that you need to be doing certain things. It's much deeper. Now, who is this woman, Proverbs 31? She is a virtuous woman. We use that, virtuous woman. I think we can do better in explaining who she is. I think we can be more specific so let me do that. The word here in the Hebrew is for virtuous is used all over the Old Testament to speak of strength, force, might, power, influence. It's used to speak of army fortifications. Believe it or not, a virtuous woman, that word for virtuous woman is used in other places as a fortification. It's used to speak of armies and soldiers. It's talking about capable power and strength. One Bible translation even calls her, as I said it, fine. <laughs> well, fine doesn't catch it all. Fine doesn't catch everything that this passage is saying. If you want an example of a valiant, and I'm using that word valiant because you think of a valiant soldier. He knows when he steps onto the battlefield what he needs to do. And when he steps onto the battlefield, he's looking out for his fellow soldiers. And oftentimes he's looking out for his country and his family back at home. And he is willing to sacrifice. And the fact that he has those values of other people tells him what to do on the battlefield. That is what a woman of virtue is and does. Her heart is beating for her Lord. Her heart is beating for her kids and for her husband and for her church and for people who are in need in the community. And she is there to serve and to pour herself out and to sacrifice. And that determines whether she decides it's time to learn to cook or it's time to learn to knit or it's time to learn to open a business. That is what the woman of valor does. She is a strong woman. So I know I've spent a good bit of time on this first relationship, her relationship to herself. We have quite a few more. We'll look at those tonight. But I want to talk for a second about my mom. Now, you would expect this on Mother's Day, but I'm not doing it just because it's Mother's Day. My mom was a working mom growing up, a secretary at the local junior high school. She was well-organized. She could multitask like few other people can do. 
One minute she would be doing administrative things, and the next minute she would be acting as a nurse, and then a consoler of distraught students, and maybe even a disciplinarian, and the, the list went on and on and on as to what my mom did as a secretary. Um, just amazing things. As a mother, she cared deeply, and she still cares deeply about her children, and she cares deeply about her husband, my dad. Decades of being married. Now, I have to tell you, most mornings we were eating cold cereal, and you say, well, what kind, of a, what kind of a virtuous woman? Doesn't it say right here that the woman, virtuous woman got up well before dawn, and she made uh, a meal? See, if that's what we're thinking, we're, we're misunderstanding the passage. The passage says that what a woman is drives what she does. And at that moment, for her to provide for her husband and for her home and to provide the things that we need needed, she would actually lay out different kinds of food. Now, here not long ago, my mother or my brother said something that stuck with me. Um, he lives out in Nebraska with my parents or, or near them, so he gets to see them more than I do. But he said, you know, Sean, he says, I'm watching, as he says, I'm watching our dear parents. <laughs> and they're acting like newlyweds. And it's just like, you know, they're, they're, they're laughing with each other, they're teasing each other, they're taking care of each other, they're enjoying being together. And I have to say, that is something that I have seen in my mom over the decades. She always takes care of my father and her kids. That's a Proverbs 31 woman. The details of what she looks like as far as what she does are different from woman to woman. But a woman who loves, a woman who loves the Lord and others around her. Ladies, where does your influence lie? Are you putting too much emphasis on physical beauty or beauty of character? Why do you do what you do? Now, let me talk to the men for a second. Men, are you affirming the godly ladies in your life? I want you to know something. Godly women are, pre, are, are tempted to do what ungodly women do as well. Do you know why? Because it gets attention. Every woman needs to be affirmed. Every woman needs to be attached to, to someone who, who expresses how much she is worth to him. And here's the thing. Women are tempted to get, shall I say, attention in ways that are totally the opposite of Proverbs 31. So what they need, our sisters in Christ need us men to step up and value things more than just physical beauty and to affirm them. So guys, today, bless the godly women in your life. Call your mom, write a note to your, to your wife or to your daughter or to your sister or to a friend who's a lady seeking to walk with the Lord. For single ladies, I want to say this. Is it worth it to wait for a guy who affirms you in godliness? Yes, it is. Single guys, is it worth it to wait for a Proverbs 31 woman? Yes, it is. That woman does exist today. She may not do everything listed here. She may not make her own clothing, but she does exist. And if she is in your home, rise up, call her blessed. Let me just say the one item that makes the foundation for a godly woman, and that is having the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Ladies, you want to be a godly woman, and you want to be this woman of influence, you know, we need to first of all come before the Lord confession, with confession of our sins and repenting and turning to faith in Christ alone. He died and rose again for you. May that be the truth for your life today. Let's pray. Father, we are just getting started in who this woman is. Father, I pray for our single men today that they would wait for a godly woman. For our single ladies that they would cultivate being a godly woman. Father, for our married ladies, I pray that they would not grow discouraged and weary, but that they would continue on enduring, even when others may be getting attention in different ways. Father, I pray for our men as husbands and dads and brothers, that we would give attention not to those who are bent on physical charm, but those who are using a godly influence. May we rise up and bless and affirm these ladies in our lives. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to see.
Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 says, My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, Come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood, but let us seek, uh, lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. My son, forsake not the instruction of your mother. May that be the truth that we honor our mothers, that we listen to them, and that we care for them. 